Good day and uh, welcome to today's episode of A Focus On. I am Fifi Peters. Uh, today we are looking at the investment market and which options are the best bang for your buck taking into consideration the current investment climate that we do find ourselves in. According to Schwab, 51% of new investors don't understand how investment fees actually work, and 41% haven't considered tax efficiency. To delve into this conversation a little further, we will be speaking to Adam Fayed, founder of Adam Fayed Brokers. Adam, thanks so much for your time. Let's just begin with a reflection on the environment that we find ourselves in right now. So globally, a lot is going on. On the one hand you've got the geopolitical risks that are mounting on the other we've got the continuation of the cost of living crisis and this environment of interest rates that are expected to remain higher for longer and the impact potentially on uh, investment returns what is your assessment of the uh, global economy right now and uh, where uh, high net worth individuals some of the in individuals who you are currently uh, uh, service where they are investing well, the environment is actually very risky at the moment in certain regards from the point of view of the economy, because obviously you've got higher interest rates, you've got commercial real estate that looks quite risky in many ways. So many things can go wrong for the economy. But we do have to remember that historically geopolitical risks haven't had a huge impact on equity valuations. So, for example, during the Cuban Missile Crisis, even during World War I and also the Spanish flu pandemic and the recent COVID pandemic, those geopolitical uh, risks haven't always resulted in lower equity valuations. So the two things aren't always linked, even though sometimes they can be linked. Um, when it comes to the current situation, I think with interest rates possibly peaking, a lot of people are looking at fixed income, where it is US treasuries, or those A-rated opportunities that have also been pushed up. So you have many a-rated firms paying 7% or more now. By the same token, you also see some people who are looking at non-US stocks, because in the last 10 to 15 years, the strong US dollar has really pushed up valuations of the S&P and the NASDAQ and the Dow Jones, whereas many markets such as, such as the ASEAN market in Southeast Asia and Africa and so on, haven't done very well when it comes to stocks. So we are starting to see other investors thinking, well, this could be peak US dollar or close to that. So they are looking to go to the emerging markets again, especially at very low valuations on the price to earnings ratio. And in many cases, high dividend yields as well. But just sticking to the US market, because some of the most expensive or valued companies in the US right now are in the tech sector. And I imagine that the investors who are plowing into that sector, are obviously investors who, who can afford to do so. But I'd just like your take on that spot as a geography to park money and whether you think that there is still room to get more in returns at the stage. Well, very long term, there's always a good chance the tech will outperform because, for example, from 2000 until 2020, the Nasdaq beat pretty much every index in the world, but it was completely stagnant from 2000 until about 2014 to 15. So very long term, tech has always been more volatile, but it has produced better returns. Having said that, technology is heavily reliant on interest rates. So we've seen kind of emerging tech with the kind of Cappy Woods kind of fund really being hammered by higher interest rates. But big tech, where it's Apple, Microsoft, and others, are in a very strong position, much stronger than big tech in 1999. So I think they could long-term benefit, but technology is inherently more risky, especially when you go to individual stocks. But very long-term, if somebody's just willing to you know, put their money to work for 30 years, I don't think anyone will necessarily uh, regret just buying the NASDAQ as an index, for example. But individual tech firms did get ahead of themselves when it comes to the valuations and the price to earnings ratios went crazy. And a lot of the projects that existed could have only existed in that 0% interest rate environment. And right now, even though interest rates are probably peaking, I don't see us going back to 0% rates anytime soon. And that will really hammer some of the smaller uh, tech stocks and some of the tech stocks that maybe aren't profitable. But I do think long-term technology is probably primed to overperform but anyone who goes into that space has to realize it's incredibly volatile and we've seen that in the last two years right last year the nasdaq was the worst performing major uh, developed market index this year has been pretty much one of the best performing so we kind of see that as a long-term trend as well so we are bullish on tech but only when it comes to long-term uh, trajectories when it comes to those kind of big solid tech firms not the more speculative 
non-profit uh, generating firms. Uh, talking then about emerging markets and uh, going back to a comment that you made uh, earlier about the uh, investment appeal in some uh, geographies in the EM space. I mean, the EM space is pretty big and uh, including China. China, who uh, has headlined for most of this year, uh, probably for the wrong reasons in terms of not delivering on the return and expectation uh, of its economic performance that was initially penciled in at the start of the year. So if we just break down the investment opportunity in the EM basket then, which parts of EM are looking attractive to you right now? Well, with China, you never really know because the data is not transparent and there's so many political aspects that could actually affect the valuations in the market. So we saw that with Alibaba and the huge crackdown on Chinese tech. So with China, you can have a good return as happened from uh, 2000 until 2006. And there was also a huge increase in equity valuations in about 2014-15 there. But with China, we do see it as very high risk. That doesn't mean it won't overperform or outperform in the future. It could do. But the risks are very, very high. What we see is Southeast Asia could be an area that could benefit a lot because the price to earnings ratios are very good. The dividend yields are very good. And also as China has become more expensive, more firms are actually moving manufacturing to Mexico or Bangladesh or certain countries in Southeast Asia like Vietnam. And besides, when you've got a very strong US dollar, it only requires a little bit of weakness from here to actually push up equity valuations. So the MSCI ASEAN market, for example, has been pretty much flat for 10 years, but we only need to see a small change in currencies to really change that. I think some of the markets in Africa could be interesting as well, uh, potentially. Um, although in that space, uh, there are fewer funds and ETFs we like because of the way the indexes often work there. But we do think long-term Africa and the African markets could be a decent place for a certain percentage of a portfolio as well. Mm -hmm. So like what then, if we break down the uh, Africa basket, uh, which uh, countries or uh, funds specifically, and when you talk about uh, the fact that uh, long-term you know, Africa could be a, a good place to be putting a portion of your money, what would you uh, reckon would be the correct uh, allocation of money uh, in this environment? Well, there's a few ways of doing it. From the point of view, we have to remember to start with, you can get broad-based allocation also from the developed markets. So for example, uh, one of the many reasons the Chinese stock market hasn't done well, despite on paper, the economic data looking good from China is that many of the US big companies actually sell into China. So if you look at every window in China, you'll probably see a Starbucks and uh, maybe an Apple store and, and, and so on. And that's the same all around the world. So the first play could be you could just invest into companies or sectors in the developed world that are actually doing better in the African market. That is one way of doing it. And of course, as Africa probably improves as a continent, you will also see more African firms doing IPOs on the US stock market in the same way that Alibaba and many Chinese companies did the same. But if you want direct equity exposure, a lot of the markets are still in the early stages. And most of the people in those markets actually want to invest internationally, which often makes sense. But possibly the South Africa's, the Mauritius's, any place where uh, potentially they're like hubs for the African region, I think they're more likely also to see companies from East Africa and West Africa actually get on the market. Because very long term, the Nigerias of this world, maybe Ghana as well, some of the East African markets, Kenya, Uganda could also do very well. But obviously, there's always huge geopolitical risks in most parts of Africa. So that means broad based uh, diversification could be important. And potentially any firm that's willing to actually IPO on foreign markets, it could be worth looking at those kind of firms as well, because often they're doing it for a reason. And also the transparency that that brings if they're willing to do an IPO on the US stock market means that there's some reassurance for investors as well. So those are a few areas that people could look at as well. When it comes to percentages, it's always very difficult to know exactly how much people should invest into different areas. Obviously, a very low risk investor maybe should consider whether to do it at all. But for most investors at their medium risk, possibly at this stage, 10 or 15% of their portfolio going into emerging markets, that's not a bad allocation, especially considering how cheap they are right now. 
And which sectors uh, then uh, would uh, be the places to uh, be looking at a little bit more closely uh, right now? Because, I mean, as I mentioned, the uh, cost of living crisis, uh, relatively high levels of inflation compared to historical uh, levels, wages that are not keeping up with uh, the price increases have cast a shadow on investing in consumer-related stocks for some, depending on which consumer you're talking about, because the U.S. consumer has obviously shown uh, th themselves to be a lot more resilient. But then you've also got this a move by uh, countries all over the world to uh, transition into carbon, uh, lower carbon uh, fuels uh, against the backdrop of the just transition that's fueling all these investments into energy and uh, renewable uh, sources of uh, power. So which sectors right now are, are looking attractive to you and uh, the sectors that uh, perhaps have longevity to continue giving uh, returns in the medium term? Well, very long term, the e-commerce and technology spaces, I don't think won't be bad places at all in the African market. Because if you think about it, most of the population growth in Africa in the next uh, few decades is going to be in Nigeria. And indeed, most of the population growth of the world is going to be in Africa. So any of those kind of uh, mass market companies equivalent to Amazon's, anything which is online focusing on the mass market, the tech market, I think that will do very well long term just from the point of view that demographics look good and um, that will actually really be a, a reason to actually invest in those mass market firms. More short term, maybe those companies that are actually focused on the bread and butter uh, side of um, the consumer, in other words, those consumer staples, you know, we all need toothpaste or we need to eat, we need to fill up our cars. Those things tend to be quite uh, recession proof uh, or even in a case where there's a cost of living crisis, we still have to buy those essential goods, right? So possibly short term, that will be a good play. But if we look very long term, we do have to remember the biggest reason to invest uh, in companies is if there's a growth trajectory. And especially in Africa, there's a huge growth trajectory, I think, when any company is online or focused on the mass market. And whatever happens this year or next year for cost of living crisis, long term, that will be the biggest market, we think, uh, in Africa. All right, Adam, uh, thanks so much for uh, sharing that uh, thesis uh, for investments uh, that you hold. Uh, that was uh, Adam Fayed. He is the founder of Adam Fayed Brokers, uh, just uh, helping us uh, wrap up uh, this uh, week's episode of Focus on. Thanks to yourselves as, you, as viewers for staying tuned throughout this very informative discussion. And until next time, it's uh, goodbye.